in the old days, cards from oh, the 1960s had a magnetic strip, right? So that when you did a transaction, the terminal would read the data on the card magnetic strip. But from 2003 in the UK, you started to get chips as well. So the information is kept in this semiconductor chip. And that makes it significantly more difficult to counterfeit. To counterfeit a, a mag strike card, all you've got to do is copy it onto a new card. But to counterfeit a chip, you've got to drill into it with lasers and probing stations and other expensive fiddly equipment and get the keys out. And that is a pain and it only works some of the time and you just don't want to go there. But don't worry if you're a criminal because there are lots and lots of easier ways of cheating chip and pin systems. Chip and pin is fun. It was designed in the late 1990s on the basis of some earlier experiments in the earlier 1990s in which we were privileged to have some small role. And it was introduced first in Britain from 2003 to 2005. So we started off with an idea of what the frauds would likely be. For example, if you have got some means of intercepting the transaction flow between a card and a terminal, say you've got a false card and you can wire it up to a false terminal elsewhere, then when a sucker puts his card into your terminal, you can teleport that to a, a dodgy card that you then present at a jeweler shop. And we demonstrated this as a proof of concept and these relay attacks uh, uh, work in theory, but you don't see them in practice. Then once chip and pin got fielded, we began to see how things changed in the real world. And fraud didn't in fact go down, but it went up. Because first of all, the bad guys went online, and although fraud initially fell a little bit in shops, it more than caught up for that by increasing online. And second, um, although fraud from um, counterfeit cards initially went down when they introduced chip and pin, what happened was that after a period of six months or so, it shot up. And what the bad guys had realized is that now you've got these chip and pin devices everywhere, you could use them to harvest chip and pin details, card details, and you could then make up mag stripe card forgeries and use them in ATMs that would still accept mag, mag stripe transactions. So we found, for example, that there was um, a dodgy chip and pin terminal in the BP garage in Girton, which caused a couple of hundred people locally to have money taken from their cash machines in Thailand, of all places. And there was a gang that got various people at garages around the country to install dodgy equipment that would capture people's chip and pin details. So that was one of the things that went wrong. It was possible, for example, to remove part of the back of a chip and pin terminal and put electronics in there and drill in so that you got into the serial link which goes between the pin pad and the card. And that gets the card details going one direction uh, and the pin going in the other direction. And that's all that you need to do mag stripe forgeries. After we demonstrated this on TV, um, the bank said, well, you know, that's a difficult attack. Cambridge students could do it, but real criminals couldn't. But only a few months later, they arrested a couple of guys in Manchester. What they'd done was get access to the warehouse in Dubai, where the chip and pin terminals stopped to catch breath en route from the factory in China to the retail trade in Britain and the Netherlands. And in the back of them, they put little mobile phones so that whenever you used this terminal, it would text your card and pin details to somebody in Karachi. And those guys eventually got off because the banks weren't prepared to offer evidence against them. It was just too embarrassing. More recently, what we discovered is that we got a number of people came to us and um, they said, look, uh, my card was stolen. It was then used in a shop. Um, the bank says it must be my fault because the pin was used and so I must have been negligent. But it couldn't have happened. I didn't use the card with the pin. So we went and we looked and we found that it's actually easy to cheat because what you can do um, is you can put a device between the card and the terminal um, which tells the terminal that the pin was accepted by the card, but tells the card that it was a chip and signature transaction. And this is an example of the electronics that you can use. You put the stolen card into the device like this, and you then use the tame card in the chip and pin device like this. And this means that the electronics can modify the transaction as it flows from your stolen smart card to the chip and pin terminal. The chip and pin machine is told that you entered the correct pin, even though you didn't, 
but the card is told that a signature verified the transaction. And it's this kind of slate of hand that enables the no-pin fraud to be carried out. And we've seen that in the wild since, gosh, about 2010, 2011. There are people in France who have been sent to jail for it. Um, there's a number of variants of it, and now we're starting to see it in China, because in China you can buy tiny little two-sided SIM cards that will go between your phone and your SIM card to enable you to do roaming more cheaply, right, so that you can roam among China's different provinces. And um, the problem with these um, slim shims is that they're just what you need to replace all this electronics. Sorry, slim sim, is it? Or a sim shim is another oh, uh, name. Shim, is it? Oh, yeah, so, so it's like shimmies in between, is that? Yep, exactly so. And so these devices can enable you to replace all this electronics with one tiny little chip that you can just slip in between the stolen card and the chip and pin terminal. Well, what we're doing is getting a man in the middle, as we call it, in between the card and the chip and pin machine so we can manipulate those parts of the transaction that aren't properly cryptographically authenticated. So that, that's the latest fraud technology. The latest fraud methodology is simpler because what you do is you take a chip and pin machine and you reprogram it. And we're now seeing evil chip and pin machines coming on the market in Europe, in Spain, in Britain, in Portugal, in the Baltics and elsewhere. And what these chip and pin machines will do is they'll um, display a small amount on the screen, say your transaction is £30 for you know, a meal or whatever, while putting a big transaction into the card, £3,000. Okay? And these are typically used in places like nightclubs and strip clubs and so on. So there's various guys from Britain have you know, gone on stag nights in Poland or in uh, Lithuania or whatever, and they come back and find there's a £5,000 transaction on their chip and pin card. How did it happen? Well, you use your chip and pin card in a strip club in Vilnius. What do you expect? Or in Barcelona, or now even in Bournemouth. This is now happening in Britain as well. And it's very, very difficult for people who, who go into a bad place and use a card, because if, if you complain to your bank, then the strip club owner will just say, well, he was with four girls all night, and £4,000 is what that costs at our place. <laughs> so you're really in the hiding to nothing when it comes to complaining. The thing about this is that the average person just doesn't think that, you know, if you pull your wallet out of your pocket, you've got, what, two or three cards in there? If each of these cards is good for five or ten thousand pounds, you know, with your overdraft limit and the extra undocumented overdraft that the bank will give you and charge you extra for, you know, there's a total spending power in your pocket of maybe twenty thousand pounds. Now, you wouldn't dream of walking into a whorehouse on a Saturday night with £20,000 in cash in your pocket, would you? But that's what people do when they walk into dodgy businesses just carrying a normal wallet with normal chip and pin cards in them. And that's a new hazard that people just aren't aware of yet. There's a classic example of the middle person attack, which was John Conway's famous idea of how to beat a grandmaster at chess. Well, it's easy. You just play two grandmasters at chess simultaneously by postal chess and you relay the moves backwards and forwards from one to the other. Playing games like this is what security engineers are really, really into when it comes to designing protocols. And protocols are hard to design right. People usually get them wrong. And again and again, we found protocol flaws with EMV, which can be exploited and are being exploited. EMV is the, the Sunday afternoon name for chip and pin. It's European MasterCard Visa protocol.